Okay, welcome everyone. Today is what? Thursday, November the 4th. And as I even say the word November, it, it's like I, I kind of choke on the word. I'm like, what? How can it be November? So welcome. This is uh, the weekly briefing for this week. Um, that is Thursday, November 4th. And I'm joined by Tim, but he's probably going to be audio. Oh, no, there you are. There's your picture. Um, he's actually on video. What do you know? Say hello from, from New York, Tim. Say hi. Hey, good to be with you all today. <laughs> I should mention, by the way, if you're part of the producer's masterclass, I apologize for not doing the office hours today. We're doing it tomorrow, 7 a.m. Pacific time. So if you haven't done your homework, you want to do homework with us as a group tomorrow, 7 a.m. So you know what, what people are really thinking, Tim, is like, I now have more time to do the homework because I had not gotten it done yet, right? Yeah, exactly. The truth is- being, My excuse is their excuse. Well, being in this industry is really like being in, in a lifelong school. We never stop learning, but they're also, we never stop having homework that, <laughs> that's due and, and teachers telling us, where's your homework? Where's your homework? So Tim, um, this, let me just mention to everyone, the weekly briefing is that time during the week where we pause to catch up on latest news, latest trend, something that's happened in the industry we want everyone to be aware of. And last week, we got into what we called producer hacks. Now, let's be honest, a hack is simply like a shortcut. It's not a long-term solution, it's not a great insight. It's just a thing to get you moving. But everyone really enjoyed that conversation because Tim, I put you on the spot and I thought you handled it pretty brilliantly if I'm, if I'm honest. Thanks. It's not the first time you've done it. So I think I've been well reversed in that process. <laughs> well, yeah, what people don't know, like, you and I always plan for the briefing. And then in real time last week, I was like, I'm just going to throw in a curveball and see how this goes. And, you know, you, you did, you came out smelling like a rose. So good job. So this, I week, hope you do it again today then. Well, I'm going to try because last week's, uh, last week's hack was like, well, help me remember it was like dealing with changes and requests and that whole client bedside matter. How do we do this Jedi mind trick? Today, we had some people asking, yeah, but what about the, the O word, the, the overages word? And I thought, let's take this half hour to talk about the simple hacks <laughs> that great producers use to manage this whole like overages issue. And I'll set it up this way. I know this, when I was an owner running my studio, I was always really nervous about asking for overages because we would frequently go into this territory called, we're going over budget. Oh my God, what do we do? What do we do? And the thought would occur to you, can we ask the client for more money? And I would always paralyze me with fear because I immediately thought, well, no, if we ask for more money, the client's going to get mad or disappointed and they're not gonna like us or me and they won't come back again. Or they won't even pay us. Like the second half might be in jeopardy because we might make somebody angry. So I, I just, I think a lot of owners, it, it's of all people you would think the owners are the ones that would be the first ones to say, hey, go get more money. But actually it's often the reverse. The owners are the ones that are saying, no, no, no. I'll just take a pay cut <laughs> or something, God forbid right? Keep the client happy. So help us out. Help, let's start with answering this question first. When is the right time to ask for an overage? And then we'll tackle the how do we do it? Well, let's actually back up one quick step because you make me think of, you know, what is the owner's concern when it comes to an overage? That they, you're right, producers kind, kind of have a sense that, hey, the client's gone, gone beyond the line and maybe this is time for overage. And there is this sense where the owner says, whoa, 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 almost double check or let's not upset the apple cart. There might be worse repercussions in asking that. And, and it makes me think like that the owners are afraid of that, um, like the production process. They don't trust their own production process that Hmm. That the producer knows it's time, you know, did, can the producer actually measure this is the right time? Um, has the producer set up the client and understanding that we give enough warning up to this point? Can my production team handle that negotiation of an overage? So that's kind of an interesting 
um, kind of thought in and of the, you have to have a production method, way of checking in, understanding the process, getting input so that when the time comes, you are also proactively working with your producer and knowing it's time to do an overage and then again, trusting that they can handle the overage process. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually re-entering my, my former life and thinking that probably my greatest fear as an owner was that I would go into raise the overage, right? Raise the overage word. And that the client would say, what do you mean? Are you telling me you're not making money on this job? That you're not still profitable? Or some sort of a question like that? And of course, I would, I would have not had a good answer to that because I would have said something like, well, no, we're still making tons of money, but, <laughs> or, right? Like, I just wouldn't have a good answer yeah. to that. So therefore, let's just avoid the whole issue and let's just eat it and do our best and move on and fight, you know, fight for, fight another day. Yeah, because the first thing the client wants to know, if you're going to have a conversation about overages, the first thing they're going to want to know is, have you done what you're supposed to do to prevent this from happening? Um, so that's, to know that part, like that's gonna be the first question I ask you as a client is like, really, do we need to have overages? Have you as a producer gone through the whole process and double checked, right? And, and some clients might even push back and go, what about this, what about this? Um, and in some clients' cases, they'll start playing the blame game. Oh, sure, I owe you an overage, but you owe me an overage when you, when you guys changed it from red to green. So there, I think that's what we know that we might get into as a possibility with a client. So when I think about manage my, my client's expectations, what I want to know first is, is that I have done all I can to prevent this overage by taking place because I've taken the time and, and work with my client to make sure that we are on task, that we are making budget, that the decision points have been met and they knew that ahead of time. We didn't just spring a decision on them. Um, and when, when given a chance, I've asked them their priorities. Hey, I wanna make sure that, we're, that this still is the priority, that we're still delivering the same thing we thought we're delivering from the beginning. Um, and I'm gonna have all of that conversation throughout the project before the time comes and say, hey, you know, when we get to this point, or now that we're making this decision, we should talk about overages. Because now you are out of the scope that I've been managing, that I've been managing on, and you are asking me to go out of scope. Let's talk about overages and, and your priorities and how to, how to uh, do this correctly. So a big word I heard in there was before, as opposed to when. You catch my drift? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that means yeah, there's some sort of anticipating that like there's a there's a plan, we're estimating what remains to be done. And then there's this, I'm looking ahead and seeing something uh, before, not when it happens. Yeah, and and uh, I think there we often struggle in this moment if we wait too late to bring it up or if we deliver it in such a way to a client that it sounds like a scorecard. Hey, according to this, you were supposed to hit it exactly like we planned and you missed the mark. Therefore, I get a chance to, to uh, give you an overage or, you know, this is, this is a penalty for stepping beyond the line. And I think it's got to be also very clear that um, the client needs to understand that you are flexible that you understand their priority, you know, whatever that priority might be. And that could be budget, time, or creative, you know, so that you've that you understand those parts of it. So when you're discussing overages with them, you're processing along with that client to recognize when we went beyond budget or the fact that we are going to go beyond budget to make sure that we still have those priorities, that scope in mind, and those needs in mind. So then this breakdown of the detail you're about to give them of why and how much that overage is going to be, you've set them up for just another decision point. Hey, let's just make another decision. Did we want to keep on going down this direction and therefore spend this money? Um, and if that answer is yes, then they were, you know, you're negotiating overages with them. Well, I think I heard you just say something really simple, but I never thought about is, did I hear you say, 
when there's a line being crossed, right? And you're, you're reaching out to that client to say, hey, I've got your back. I'm letting you, making you aware of something that's coming that you're actually giving them options at that moment, rather than just saying, hey, you crossed a line and we're heading towards overages. Let's talk about overages. Maybe there's, we've crossed a line and now we have a decision to make. Option A might be reduce the scope, <laughs> shift the deadline. That's option B. Option C is this, 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 but that includes overages. Is that part of what you're suggesting? Yeah, because imagine like when we agreed together to do this project, there was an understanding of where we're going to go, how long it was going to take, and what the creative output is going to be. So you're kind of saying, now that we know what we know, do we still want to stick with our original bid and stay on budget? Or do we want to take these, now that these new priorities, these new understanding, and explore something new, take more time to do what you're asking us to do, and therefore spend the money to do it? I just want to know which one you want to do. I'm producing the project for you. We are very flexible. We're, we have confidence we can deliver the original even better than we thought at the beginning. Um, but also, if you really want to go down this path, we're confident we can get there. Let's just talk about how we're going to collaborate together and make that happen. Yeah, you said a phrase there that I thought was actually really cool. Now that we know what we know. And I'm thinking, man, isn't that the truth about the way the creative process actually unfolds? is we make this beautiful thing at the beginning called a plan. But the reality is there's all these assumptions and we kind of think it's gonna go like this, but the reality is if we're maybe honest with the client up front, that we don't know what we don't know, but as we go along, we will know what we know and we'll make decisions together once we get there. That's a, like, that's a collaborative, we're, we're working on this and working it out together, as opposed to you crossed a line that maybe you didn't even know you crossed and it's like, oops, you made a mistake and now we need to talk about you giving me more money. And I'm like, wait, what? Since when, how? No wonder I would be, I would be mad. <laughs> yeah. And if you say, if you say, hey, you crossed a line last week and now I, have to, now I have to charge you for it, that's a very difficult conversation to take place. And yeah, as an owner, you may be very nervous. Like it's too late to start that conversation. And going back to the idea of like ruining your relationship because you weren't there, but that collaborate, collaborative um, effort is something that you you want to work with. Here's the other thing I'm thinking overages are good for. You know, you're you're not you don't need to use an overage to penalize your client, but you really are using overages to manage them too. There's a little bit of a management process in that you want to keep them on scope and you want to keep them on on the task and keep them uh, making those decisions. So not necessarily as a penalty or even more important you don't even have to accrue any new costs. It doesn't have to cost you another dollar. You have a flat bid, spending the same money, no matter, no matter if they made the decision or not, but it might be a good chance to bring up an overage just as a management tool to recognize, hey, we can't go out of scope too often. An example I have is a, a client recently has a team and they're doing four different deliverables for their client. And the client moved the second deliverable out in three weeks and that team can be repurposed inside the company. So truthfully speaking, they're not out of pocket anything more. And I had to say to them, yeah, but you still want to charge the client an overage, or at least discuss overages. Even if you give it up, you say, hey, I should, but I'm not going to get a little bit of a, you know, uh, an IOU from the client. Um, but you do that so that client knows you can't just change schedule. Because sure now, it, today it doesn't hurt us, but there might be a time in the future and I need to, make sure we're understanding how this process works together. And that would be a major change. It's not just a 24 hour change, it's a four week change. That's too much. And we should discuss how that works when you work with us. Very positive, very open conversation and very informative to how both sides need to work. Yeah, it's a thought of that. Um, if the client changes the scope or the deadline, you know, the first time they make the change, you know, shame on you. But if it happens again, shame on me <laughs> type of a thought. Um, I was going to actually yeah. raise, uh, Robin was here, had posted a question. I thought it might be fun for us to uh, throw this into the mix because thank you for the question, Robin. It says, uh, what about when the client all of a sudden adds more eyeballs like their boss or some other stakeholder on a project? And then we are making changes based on those people, even though we were, we were on the same, or sorry, on the schedule and on budget up until that point. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think one of those items that are often hidden when we give someone a proposal is we can say, here's the budget, here's the schedule, and here's the creative. Do we agree? Yeah. Let's write a proposal. And one of the things we often forget is like, here's the decision-making process. So almost have an understanding of expectation of as we get forward, you have 24 hours to make decisions. You have, um, we will make these decisions, this first five decisions together as a small group and then let you run that out the executive chain. Um, but if the executive chain changes things, we can go backwards or we only go forward. And I think that's often something that in the creative part of our industry, we don't bring that up enough or understand that enough. I find in the tech space, when you're building websites or writing uh, computer software, building a game, it's very much understood that we're going to get to a gate. And when we pass that gate, there's no one going back. Um, but that's something we could all really, really learn. Um, and yeah, for sure, when the client basically runs up the, the flagpole, and by the way, there's, they're talking about middle management in a way, saying, trust me, but my, my boss does want it red. We have to do it red. Red is good. I'm going to now verify with my boss. The boss says he wants it blue. You go, sorry, remember you approved red, and I wrote you an email two days ago that the red was approved, and we did everything in red. That's what... When I was saying that, that means, yeah, you should ask your boss two days ago if it was low. That is the client's fault. They do definitely pay for it when, when that happens. Well, you, you you know, I was just thinking about this and maybe Robin is, is in that mode of like, okay, so next time <laughs> or from now on, I will. Because I really like that language you talked about when we go through these gates. And I, I'm just thinking of a production calendar and how there's there's all these different activities. Those aren't necessarily gates, but there are these milestones where we say, hey, when we go through this, this gate, you understand and we agree that backing up and going back through that is, we'll have to have a discussion of change, you know, various changes, whether it's scope, deadline, budget, whatever. And just setting that expectation at the very beginning of the project, which of course, is when we hate managing expectations because that's the honeymoon phase. Like we just awarded the project. It's going to be so fun. It's so exciting. And I know owners hate to say things to the clients like, right, it is going to be great. But remember, help me help you that this is how it's going to go. <laughs> yeah. It's, when working with, a, with an advertising agency, you know, they're making decisions on behalf of their client, the brand. And they do a lot of internal work before they show it forward to the brand. And there is a gap between what the creative director at the agency wants and what the, the CMO or the decision makers at the brand want, right? So we know there's this middle, this time that you, there's a gap between the decisions. If I know that up front, I'm going to build that pad in there. When I'm discussing that my budget with the client, I tell them, oh, and then I have this pad. So when your client changes everything, we can go backwards. And that agency might say, we don't need that. And I say, okay, I will take that out of the budget. And then I will document that I took that out of the budget. So then later on in the future, I say, hey, hey, by the way, your client changed their mind. I can say, don't you remember when we took that out of the budget? Remember, remember where, our, where that was the decision we made earlier and now we have to change that mind because now we know what we know, we can fix that. So that is an early way of Putting, planting some seeds that you can leverage later on if necessary. It's totally legitimate. You've called out what the process is. Um, but also in those situations, you can recognize that they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Right? And by the way, you are going to be the final scapegoat because they're not going to say, it's all my fault. They're going to say, oh, the team we're working with it is not you know, delivering what we expect it to. They're, everyone kind of pr uh, preserves themselves that way. So you can also make a decision that moment of like, well, when do I give in and create like an IOU or some other sort of expectation, or this might not be the right thing to do overage, but we know two weeks from now that there's going to be a moment where we could tell the client there's an overage. And so you might, you can even work with a client to find those leverage points and find future meaningful moments that the client would agree with and more easily accept an overage or the ultimate client, the brand could become that over. And so you can, I, it's funny, like I found someone this recently where I almost imagine what I want the conversation to be when the time comes. 
and then I, I start working my way into that conversation sooner than later so that when the moment comes, if I have to say it, I've already thought about the conversation. I've actually planted the seeds for it. And then the time comes, I can easily voice that part. And I, and maybe going back to the first comment made, that's why owners might sometimes be nervous because they haven't thought through what that's going to sound like and have kind of made that possible to have that conversation. Part of what I heard you saying there was a little bit like that idea of the Jedi mind trick, right? You remember that the moment when Obi-Wan says, these aren't the droids you're looking for? If I remember correctly, he they don't say, hey, are these the droids we're looking for? He He's already had the conversation. And he's in, it's like inception. He's putting it into their mind. Like, this is how this conversation is going to go. I'm telling you <laughs> almost what I want you to think and what I want you to believe. And it's, it's a little bit like what you're describing there. Yeah, the Jedi mind trick that I am often credited for is that I've given them three clues. And then they drew their own conclusion. And then they call me and tell me the answer to the clues. So I didn't have to voice it myself, right? So I would imagine one of the clients to call me and say, hey, I know we're getting into overage territory. Can I talk to you? That's so much a better conversation than me to say like, hey, we're getting into overage conversation. Can I talk to you? So yes. what, how do I plant seeds that the time comes to the client says, I, I understand I'm there, but I need to have an honest conversation. Awesome. I'm here to listen. How can I help solve your problem for you? <laughs> um, and that's the twist you're looking for. Yeah, that, <laughs> well, it's interesting. So now I'm thinking to like to, back to our, our central question. One of, the, one of the two questions was when to ask for overages. In a way, what I heard you say was at the very beginning of the project. Now you're not asking for overages, but you've thought through when I will ask for overages because you've mentioned it at the beginning. You've created those very helpful, call it guardrails right, for that client, yeah. and that's a total inception move. If you can get a client to call you and say, hey, I know we just went through the third gate and I'm calling with some feedback that I should have given you a few days ago, so we're probably getting into over just territory, but can we talk about this? Holy cow, yes, yes, please. Yeah, yeah, and you can do, here's some setups you can do at the beginning of a project. You can start um, explaining to your client your method, you say, uh, just so you know, the way we work on commercial projects is like this. And we know that these changes take place. So we build those into our timeline and our budget. You can see that on my schedule. Now you can give your client a different schedule than what I'm giving you, but I'm being very transparent of what makes up my budget, what makes up my schedule. So I have this expectation of that path. But if we go beyond that moment, you know that I'm out of scope and out of budget. That, and, and I'll tell you right then I know the client's going to push back on me and say, I don't want to pay for something that I haven't yet accrued. And I go, okay, I'll take that on my budget. I'll take that on my schedule. Yeah. Guess what happens? When the time <laughs> comes, they know they made the decision, not me. And I'm like, okay, what if this was your decision? I'm happy to work with you. What do we need to do? Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I, I just, I love that idea of building in, in advance and creating the expectation in advance. And even like giving them the power, giving them the choices of like, okay, you can make this decision. Um, another phrase that I would say is one of my favorites to position yourself kindly and gently as the expert is when you're explaining that process, you say, here's what we find works best, which is a very nice way of saying, by the way, we've done this a million times. Yes, we are the experts. And I'm gonna share with you some friendly advice so that as we go through this process, this is how we will succeed together. Because at that moment, if you get resistance, you know you're dealing with someone who thinks you're an order taker and watch out. But if they say, oh, please tell me more. Tell me more, Tim, how is, you know, what do you guys find? works best and you say, well, in order to avoid overages, we do these kinds of things, right? In order to stay on track and on deadline, we do these kinds of things. And that's like, okay, thank you. Thank you for involving me in this process. Yeah, and, and do you, if you have a sense that they're not listening to you or didn't quite hear what you said, write it down, put it in writing, send them an email, right at that moment. Cause that's gonna be your backup that you did tell them. So, 
some people they you you know when they catch on to what you what you say is and you're in a great conversation it's very very clear and it'll stick and other people you're afraid it's not gonna stick so you just say hey just quick follow up from our last conversation we are going to remove those items from our budget no problem it's about five thousand dollars less to the project we did take out those days and these days so in case they come back we will be we now have a predetermined budget of what that's going to look like um so that it's all in writing and it's clear and then you pull out that email later on and you say hey just so you know we're going to have to we're at that moment let's start talking or we're getting close to that moment and if we don't hear back within the next 24 hours we're gone beyond our scope so can you please get the information you need from your client so that we stay on scope and we don't get into the situation you've asked me to manage for you which is keep you on budget keep you on schedule you're reminding me because we talked about in uh, in this jumpstart workshop today we talked about um, contracts and I was making this point that if you think you need to have contracts because when things go sideways you have something in writing that's <clears throat> potentially legally enforceable I'm like trust me if it ever gets to that point a contract is the is not at all the solution because when a contract has to be enforced, that's just a sign that expectations were horribly mismanaged somewhere back in the past. Yeah, and, and you know, it's legalese. You're walking through legal language and legal conversation to make sure, you know, there are all repercussions are understood. Absolutely, you're doing all you can to avoid, avoid that. It's so rare that you really get into pulling out a contract to deal with something. Yep. Um, in my experience, it's really only been when we're trying to exit a project in the middle. Our our exit clause, our cancellation clause, is often the one thing I've had to, re to refer to. And sometimes um, the policy of who owns the footage or and payment terms. Those are really the only three major things that you would go to more frequent than not. The rest of that is you're doing all you can to avoid it. Yeah, and you're merely referencing the contract. You're not trying to enforce it by going to court and all that. That's a whole nother level that obviously is to be avoided and is easily avoidable, yeah. honestly. Yeah. Um, well, this has been yeah, fun. I, I, I'm, I'm excited. Tomorrow we'll get into our next uh, masterclass. And do you want to give folks just a little tiny peek of what we're going to hash out tomorrow in that, in that group? Yeah, we're actually talking about um, it's it's not quite un, unrelated to, to this where um, in the production process, besides just setting up the expectation of what comes next, we also want to set things up so that we um, always hit our mark and that our clients almost give us praise back. So we're actually now kind of start teaching clients and talk, our producers and talk about the skill of, of that negotiating factor when it's working out very well for you and we get that return. Um, and there will be more homework. So uh, if you're in the master class, get your homework done today because there's going to be more homework for you tomorrow. More homework. There's always more work to be done. Well, I, um, I appreciate you jumping on the Zoom here uh, in the midst of your busy travel day. Uh, we're going to try and we're actually at the 30 minute mark, so we should probably wrap it up. Um, Tim, what else do we want to say as we close? What do we always say? We're here so that you can thrive in business, life, and careers. So if I have to go to NFT conference for you, I guess I'll suffer and go to NFT conference for you. Um, but we love you all. We're so thankful to be, to be part of this journey with you. Yeah, thank you, Tim. All right, thanks everyone who uh, joined us today. I always appreciate seeing you guys in the weekly briefing. Um, next week, I think we're gonna be talking about the talent shortage. Like anyone feeling that crunch, the lack of freelancers and ability to hire people. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll, of course, announce it hopefully a few days before so you can prepare. And we'll see you back here on Thursday. Tim, have a good trip home. Thanks, Joel. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye, everyone.